This is going to be part two of the Luke overview. Now, Luke has a lot in it. And since it's so long, there's no way we could just cover all of it. So I just want to point out some things that really stuck out to me and hopefully give you an idea of what the book of Luke is all about. I hope you'll go back and watch part one before you listen to this one. We're picking back up in chapter 11. Chapter 11, Jesus is accused of casting out devils with the power of the devil. Just like many times today, they accuse the things of God to be the things of the devil. They call evil good and they call good evil. And you also see in this chapter how unclean spirits can take up residence in a lost person. In Luke eleven twenty four, it says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. So notice, it caused the lost person's body his house. So a lost man's body is the housing of unclean spirits, like a safe person's body is the housing of the Holy Spirit. And I believe a Christian can be devil-possessed in the sense that the devil can get a hold of his flesh, but he can't get the man's soul, and he's not going to be able to just indwell the saved person like he does a lost person. But I mean, he can, uh, the uh, unclean spirits can can get a hold of a saved person's flesh. So you don't want the unclean spirits hanging outside of your house. You don't want them inside your house like a lost person. And you don't want them outside of the, your house either. It's just like uh, your, your physical house. I mean, you don't want to go outside and see a bunch of thugs in your front yard. You don't. You obviously don't want them in your house, but you don't want them in your front yard either. There's no telling what they could do to your the outside of your house. That's just like the unclean spirits in your your house of your body. I mean, if you let unclean spirits lead you and guide you, there's no telling what you'll do with the outside of your house. They can't get in your house. They can't get your soul, but you can yield your members as to, to be instruments of unrighteousness and be led by the devil or unclean spirits. So this also shows that the unclean spirit isn't at rest unless he is in a body. It says, He seeketh rest, seeking rest and findeth none. And in Luke eleven twenty five, and when he cometh, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. When he goes back to that man he was in before, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. He finds it swept and garnished because the lost person got religion, possibly, when he was gone. He got religion, but he didn't get salvation. So the unclean spirit is allowed to go back inside and, and, and dwell that lost man because he didn't get salvation. You see, you can clean up your life without Jesus Christ and still be damned. A person can clean up their life. They can turn over a new leaf. They can appear saved to people. They can have counterfeit works. They can profess things with their mouth that they don't truly believe in their heart. In Luke eleven twenty six, it says, Then goeth he, and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So the unclean spirit went back and got some of his buddies, and now that man's state is worse than it was the first time. The, the last state of that man is worse, not only because now he has more unclean spirits, but because religious lost people and devils are a bad combination. Somebody that goes and gets religion, and not pure religion, but religion without salvation, and then mix that with unclean spirits, that's a very evil person most times. Luke 12, 2 and 3. Looking at Luke chapter 12 now. It says, For there is nothing hid that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear and closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. You think you're alone, but someone is always watching. Who sees you sinning? If you're alone in your room, who sees you sinning? 
The Lord sees it. Angels see it. Unclean spirits see it. I mean, possibly even the the government sees it and hears it now. I mean, you, you got the iPhone. It's a listening to everything you're saying. Your TV's listen to what you're saying. Your remote controls listen to what you're saying. I mean, they've got the voice um, control now where you just say what you want to watch and it comes on the TV. Somebody's listening. Somebody's seeing it. Your neighbor could be watching for all you know. You never know who's watching. But you know, for one thing for sure, the Lord is always watching. And nothing is getting by him. God has evidence against man, and you're guilty. You say, well, I don't leave any fingerprints. I don't leave any evidence. Don't you know that God is the one that made the fingerprints? Job 37, 7 says, He sealeth up the hand of every man, that all men may know his work. He's the one that put your hand together and made it unique from everybody else's. In Luke 12, 4 through Five, he says, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear, fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. This shows that hell isn't just uh, the grave. You're not just being buried in the ground. If you're lost, you're going to go to hell and burn. He says, fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. After he kills the body, he casts the lost into hell. It's not just going to the grave. Luke twelve twenty two through 25, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking one thought, can add to his stature one cubit? That's a rough verse for a little man. If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Quit taking thought on stuff ye can't control. So many people are full of thoughts about the wickedness in this wicked government, about the vaccine, about everything going on. They're so worried about this stuff 24 hours a day. And, you know, I like to look into conspiracy things and stuff like that, but I don't let that consume me. I focus on the scriptures. You know, my studies I do on here isn't just so much stuff about conspiracy theories. It's just about the Bible and the scriptures and just keeping myself in that all the time. I don't want to keep myself in st stuff that's just makes people worry i mean it's good to be aware of what's going on but you don't want to let that just be what you're always dwelling on you're taking thought on stuff you can't control focus on what you can control focus on your fellowship with jesus christ if you do that then you're in good shape you can't stop this wicked world from being wicked the bible said it's gonna be what are you gonna do just stop prophecy from being fulfilled the Bible says evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I mean, we're supposed to witness to people. We're supposed to preach against sin. But when it comes right down to it, I can't just change the whole world. I mean, it's good to have that that much zeal in you to where when you go out, you think, well, I'm going to change the whole world. But you got to remember, you can't change the whole world. The world's wicked and it's always going to be wicked. So if you quit taking thought about all the evils going on in the world and worrying yourself sick about it, you're probably going to serve God a lot better. Chapter 13. You see a woman with a spirit of infirmity in Luke 13, 16 through 17. It says, And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. So this proves Satan himself attacks individuals, because Satan bound that woman. And so he's attacking individuals. A lot of people think that he's not going to attack you personally. 
but he does because he's called your adversary. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So Satan had this woman bound. And you think you're free when you're living for the devil, but you're actually bound. You're actually more in chains. Romans 6.20, For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. So this woman was bound by the devil. Just like he's got people bound in their sin today. They may not have anything wrong with their body, but they're, they're still in chains by the devil. They're serving sin. So this woman was enchained, in chains by the devil. It's like that band, Alice in Chains. Maybe this woman's name was Alice or something. But everybody serves something. If you're going to serve, then why not serve God? The devil just pimps you out to people. He will give you a little bit of money on the side while he uses you to catch souls. He's getting the most out of the deal. He's just pimping you out like a hoe or something. Chapter 15, the, the one lost sheep and the prodigal son is what you, what you see. In Luke 15, 4, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? This shows that God is also concerned with each individual. It matters to him about one single person. Just one. I mean, if... If there's a hundred people living right and there's that one person not living right, he's concerned with that single person. That's a comforting thing. Most people won't even give the time of day for just one person. Another person won't give the time of day for just one person. But it is amazing that the God of the universe does. Have you ever tried to reach out to somebody and they won't have anything to do with you? It's because... Most people aren't concerned with just one person. If it's not a bunch of people, then they're not giving it the time of day. But God does. Luke fifteen five. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. When he finds that one lost sheep, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Jesus Christ can carry a lot on his shoulders. And in Isaiah 9, 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The government shall be upon his shoulder. He put the sins of every man on his shoulders when he endured the cross. Luke fifteen six and when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Not only does he come after a single sheep, but he is so happy he has you that he celebrates with everyone else. In Luke fifteen seven, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. So this should show you the importance of one soul. If the devil goes after the individual, you see God going after the individual. Both of them are. The devil is concerned with each individual soul. God is concerned with each individual soul. And this chapter also talks about the prodigal son who leaves home with his inheritance to go out and live wicked. In Luke fifteen thirteen, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. If you're a Christian who is backslid on God, then you are wasting your inheritance on this world. You'll get your reward down here and it is temporal, and you're losing your reward up there that would be eternal. Luke 16, you got the parable of the rich man, and you got the parable about the unjust steward. Well, let me take that back. I said that completely wrong. I said it backwards. The story of the rich man is not a parable. It's the parable of the unjust steward and the account of the rich man and Lazarus. Because a lot of people are saying that that, loss, that, that that story of the rich man and Lazarus is a parable. But it's not a parable. It's an actual event 
there's actually a, a rich man that's still in eternity, and Lazarus is in eternity. And Luke's, but first let's look at that unjust steward. In Luke 16, 13, it says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So mammon is riches and wealth. You can't serve God and serve money at the same time. God may give you money, but if you're getting it crookedly, then you're not serving God. You're not serving God if you're getting money crookedly. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Luke 16 also has the famous story, as I said, of the rich man and Lazarus. It's not a parable. He's not just coming up with an illustration here that's a fake story. This was a real event. The rich man is still in the same hell that he was in back then. In Luke 16, 22 and 23, it says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. The rich man not only died and was buried, but lifted up his eyes, being in torments, he could see, he could feel, he was thirsty. He can still see and feel, and he's still thirsty. Luke sixteen twenty four, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. You see these accounts of people who claim to have died on the operating table or something, or been in a car wreck and died and their heart stops and they see things after their heart stops, but most times it doesn't line up with the Bible at all. One one time I heard this guy talking about how he died, and he woke up in this cave, and there's water dripping everywhere, and he said he knew he was in hell. Uh, I don't know where he was. He was just in some place in his mind, but that wasn't hell because there's no water in hell. In Luke 17, the Lord talks about his day. Luke seventeen twenty four for as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. And he compares it to the days of Noah in Luke seventeen thirty seven. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the, be, the eagles be gathered together. This is a reference to when the fowls are filled with the flesh of the dead carcasses at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you know what uh, Noah does? when He lets that raven out of the ark and it doesn't come back. It's feeding on them dead carcasses out there. When Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming and he's slaying those God haters, those fowls are going to come down and be filled with the flesh of the enemies of God. In Luke 18, you got the great story of the Pharisee and the publican. In Luke 18, 10, and 11, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. He said, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. One of the things he called them was unjust. However, he is unjust. Ecclesiastes 7.20, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. He's thanking God for, being, for not being unjust as other men are, when in Ecclesiastes it says, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. I mean, I thank God that he's helped me from... He's helped keep me from making a bigger mess than I already have. That's about as far as you can go with it. You could have made an even bigger mess if God hadn't helped you in some way. But there is one thing I know, and I can't say about myself, I can't say that I'm just. I'm not just in the sense of my flesh. The only way I'm just is if you're looking at my soul. It has the righteousness of Jesus Christ on it. My life my state 
is something else. It's unjust. My flesh is wicked. The old man is wicked. It's the new man. It's the new creature inside that's holy and perfect and sinless. And that's what's getting me to heaven, is the new man. This flesh is unjust. And this Pharisee says, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. He does all this stuff to be seen of men, though, and with the wrong motives. Good works with the wrong motives aren't going to do you any good. Luke eighteen thirteen. look at the difference. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the right attitude. Come to God humble. It says, and I, I'll tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Quit trying to exalt yourself. Quit trying to brag to other people about yourself. You're not going to be exalted that way. Nobody's impressed by you. Nobody wants to hear you bragging about yourself. In this chapter, you also see the story of the rich young ruler. He counted his material things more important than anything else. In Luke 18, 24, and 25, And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is, it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. There is a country song that's so stupid that mocks his verse. And he talks about how money can't buy everything. But he says, but it can buy me a boat and a truck and all kinds of other stuff he says that I can't remember. So this country singer is someone that knows some of what God said, but yet he's rejecting it. He's making a mockery of it. He's worse than the rich young ruler. He didn't learn from the word or the mistakes of others. He says money can't buy everything, but... It can buy me a boat and a truck and a gun and a and a house. He's not getting it. And he, he even says in the song, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. So that's someone that is a Bible rejecter. That song is just as ungodly as Marilyn Manson ripping a Bible on stage. It's just packaged different. The country boy is not going to listen to to Marilyn Manson ripping up a Bible. He's not going to do that, most likely. I mean, they might now, but used to, they wouldn't. But he'll listen to that trash. He'll put that in and hear somebody mock the words of God because it's in that country, country boy lifestyle package. Satan has something for everybody. He's got music that will reach everybody. Both of them are satanic. And if you think about it, that country song is even worse because it's more deceptive. It's packaged much different. And then and once again in chapter 18, Jesus will foretell his death, burial, and resurrection. In Luke 18, 31 through 34, Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to, go, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spit it on, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. So Jesus just described to his disciples the death, burial, and resurrection before it even took place. Jesus Christ is a true prophet. He knows what he came to do. He knows what he's got to do. But then look what verse 34 says. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. So they didn't understand it. It was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. So if it was hid from them. And in 1 Corinthians Paul says. If our gospel be hid. It is hid to them that are lost. And Jesus just gave them the gospel and it was hid from them. Does this mean the disciples at that time were lost? Absolutely not. Because it was under a completely different time. It was under a different dispensation. Notice that the disciples had no understanding of what he was talking about. They were not looking forward to the cross. But rather looking forward to a kingdom and a crown. See in the Old, the Old Testament saints... They weren't looking for the Savior to come down the cross. They were looking for him to come and take over. They were looking for a real 
gold crown on his head, not a crown of thorns. So people were not looking forward to the cross. And verses like this just make that teaching look completely foolish. Because it, they understood none of the things. It was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. I mean, if, if I'm talking to you, and I tell you the, the gospel, and you don't understand it, and the sayings hid from you, and you don't know the things which I've just spoken, then you're lost. Because today, if you don't understand that gospel, you, you're you not saved. I mean, you have, if, if I go up to somebody and they tell me they're saved, and I say, well, what saved you? And, and they say, well, living a good life or being baptized. And I say, don't you know Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? He was buried and resurrected. And they say, no, I didn't know that. Well, obviously that person's not saved because they don't even know what saves them. They don't even know why they need to be saved. But it wasn't the case for the disciples. They didn't understand. It was under a different setup. And it was hid from them. It wasn't because they were stupid that they didn't understand. It was hid from them. You see, you don't understand these things because you're smart. You understand them because God revealed it to you and he didn't reveal it to them. Luke 19, Zacchaeus has Jesus over for dinner. Luke 19, 5 through 7. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. So more proof that Jesus Christ believed there was so much value in the soul of one man. Not only did would he feed the 5,000, and affect a whole bunch of people at once. But he would, he would go and deal with one soul. Out of his when in his 33 year of years of life, he thought it was important enough for him to take time to go and deal with one soul. And of course the Pharisees accused him of hanging out with sinners. Jesus took time for sinners, but he didn't participate in their sinful activities. Luke 20, in chapter 20, men try to catch Jesus in his words with hard questions. They ask him, who gives him authority? They ask him if he should, if they should pay tribute to Caesar. They ask him a hard question about marriage and who will be wife and husband in the resurrection. And he answers all the questions so well that he stumps them. Sometimes he answers a question with a question. And he also warns about the scribes. He says in Luke 20, 45 through 47, Then in the, in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes, which desire to walk in long robes, and love greetings in the markets, and the highest seats in the synagogues, and the chief rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses, and for a show make long prayers. The same shall receive greater damnation. Some people... They love to walk around in clothes that show they have some high up position of authority. They love the VIP section and the seats right up front where they can get their most attention. Everything they do is for show. They can't just pray. They have to put on a big, the big theater type prayer. When the prayer is a, a prayer in public, they've got to act like it's a big show, a big theater play or something. These lost religious people are the ones who actually receive greater damnation that Jesus is talking about. So this proves that not everyone will experience the same pain in hell. Some parts of hell are worse than others. I mean, I don't believe a, a good, a, a lost man who has good, good morals and goes to work every day and provides for his family and did some good things. He's still going to hell, but obviously he's not going to go to as bad of a hell as the Pope's going to. I mean, the Pope is deceiving billions of people. That country boy that's just lost, he affected, I mean, you always affect people with what you do, but he's not going to experience a greater damnation like these lost religious people who are leading millions of people to hell. Luke 21, the poor widow cast in all that she has. And Jesus explains that how even though this woman only put two mites in, she actually put in more than everyone because she put in all that she had. And Jesus explains also what will come to pass in the last days in this chapter. 
he, you know, he, he describes how many will come claiming to be Christ. You're going to hear of wars and commotions, nations against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes, famines, pestilences, saints delivered into prisons, but people being betrayed by their own family. Saints are going to be hated for his name's sake. And he goes on to explain his second coming in Luke 21, 25 through 28. And things you need to realize is that this isn't describing when the Lord comes back to get us at the rapture. It's actually describing when he comes back with us at the second coming. In Luke 21, 25, it says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. You see, in this time period that he's talking about, this future time period, God goes back to dealing with Israel, with the Jews, and there will be signs. Notice it says, and there shall be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. Me and you, we're not looking for a sign, but somebody is. In 1 Corinthians one twenty two, one twenty two, it says, for the Jews require a sign. In Luke twenty one twenty six, it says, men's hearts filling them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Everything is going to be leveled. All these movies that Hollywood advertises are copying the most horrifying event in history, and that is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Movies like 2012, San Andreas, The Day After Tomorrow, all those disaster movies are a Sunday school picnic compared to when Jesus Christ comes back. I mean, there's going to be an earthquake, so mighty an earthquake and so great, Revelation 16, 18, such as was not since men were up on the earth. Luke 21, 27, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in, the cl in a cloud with power and great glory. Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Luke 21, 28, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your, your re redemption draweth nigh. These events, this is talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes down to take over. And he comes down with us on white horses. Luke 22, the, you got the plot to kill Jesus. You got Judas betraying Jesus. You got the Lord's Supper and the disciples talking about who is the greatest. And Jesus also foretells about Peter's denial in this chapter. So notice the patience the Lord has that we see he has just in this chapter. He has all these big shots wanting to kill him. All these people want to kill him. One of his own disciples is betraying him for money. He foresees Peter denying him. The, and the rest of the disciples are just wondering which of one of them will be the greatest. And he foresees that he's going to be taking the, the Lord's cup of wrath on him. And he's praying so hard that his sweat is as great drops of blood. I mean, talk about a bad week, a bad day. Remember all this when you think you're having a bad day. Look at what all the Lord goes through just in this chapter. Luke twenty two forty three, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Wouldn't it be a blessing to get to be that angel? I mean, he, he could go back up to heaven and talk to other angels and say that he is the angel that went down and strengthened Jesus Christ. But if you're a born-again believer today, then Jesus Christ is the one that strengthens you. But you can strengthen his influence wherever you are just by preaching his name. You can do the same thing that angel did. And Judas comes to betray Jesus Christ with a kiss in this chapter. Ju Judas greeted Jesus with an unholy kiss. You know, Paul, Paul talks about greet one another with an holy kiss. Judas came and greeted Jesus with an unholy kiss. It was as unholy as Gene Simmons. And Judas probably had a larger tongue than Gene did, too. And did you know that idol worship involved a kiss? In Hosea 13, 2, And now they sin more and more, and have made them molten images of their silver and idols according to their own understanding, all of it the work of the craftsmen they say of them. Let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. I mean, you see a kiss as positive. You see it as something pe peaceful. Judas came in and betrayed the Son of Man with a kiss. The Antichrist comes in peaceably. 
and obtains the kingdom by flatteries. He flatters with his lips. You know, a, a kiss can be deceptive. It can be, it can truly show that somebody loves somebody, but at the same time, it can be very deceptive. An adult, an adultery, the act of adultery, that could, that starts with a kiss. I mean, after they've talked and thought about each other, then one of them goes in for a kiss, and it betrays their spouse or spouse is. So Jesus, he, how, how deceptive he tries to be a Judas, he, with the Judas kiss. Jesus is about to be taken by the soldiers. Peter cuts off one of their ears, and the Lord puts the soldier's ear back on. I bet every time that this guy tried to clean out his ears with a Q-tip, he remembered taking the Son of God. I bet he remembers when he when Peter cuts off his ear. This guy's name is Malchus. I bet every time he cleans out his ears, he remembers that that Son of God was true. The, the Son of God was truly the Son of God. Because how else could he have got his ear put back on like that? And didn't even have any hearing loss, probably. It says in Luke twenty two sixty three through 65, And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And many other things blasphem blasphemously spake they against him. Jesus could have told the guy's name, his date of birth, where he lived, what he ate for breakfast, and how many hairs was on his head. And they're sitting there saying, prophesy, who is it that smote thee? So these men obviously had no idea what they were doing or who they, I mean, they didn't, these Roman soldiers, they didn't, they were just following their orders. They had no idea that this was truly God in the flesh that they were killing here. But this just goes to show you, they said, prophesy, who is it that smote thee? You don't have to answer every fool that asks you a question. I mean, they weren't going to believe him anyway. Luke 23, Jesus goes before Pilate, and Pilate asks him if he is a king of the Jews, and Jesus says, Thou sayest it. Pilate couldn't find no fault in him, he says. So he sends him to Herod because he was of Herod's jurisdiction. Luke 23, 12, On the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. You see, men will gather together against Jesus, just like they do at the second coming. But Pilate was going to release Jesus at the feast, but the people yelled, Crucify him. And he ended up releasing Barabbas instead. And Barabbas was a wicked man and a murderer. But you know what this picture is? This picture is Jesus Christ taking our place. Barabbas should have been the one crucified, but Jesus died in his place. Barabbas is set free. We should have died on the cross. Jesus died in our place. We're set free. Jesus is hung between two other men. One of them died in his sins. The other one is alive in heaven today. And he simply said to the Lord in Luke 23, 42, And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And a man named Joseph takes Jesus off the cross and laid him in a sepulcher hewn in stone. In Luke 23, 52 and 53, this man went into Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, and he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. Chapter 24, the women uh, which came with him from Galilee came to the sepulcher, and the stone was rolled away. And then these two guys in shining garments show up, and these two angels tell the women that he's risen. They say, Why seek ye the living among the dead? In Luke 24, 9 through 12, and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. So they go back and they tell him about how they, he's not there, he's risen. And it says, and it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and the Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with him, which told these things unto the apostles. Now look at this. When they go tell this stuff to the apostles, it says, and, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. So they, the apostles didn't believe it. Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher, 
unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Once again, this shows that the disciples and Old Testament saints did not understand the gospel. The words of the, those women seemed to them as idle tales, and Peter wondered in himself at that which was come to pass. If he was looking forward to the cross and the death, burial, and resurrection this whole time and had heard that from a, as a kid, he would have thought, well, this is it. This is Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. He was buried and resurrected. But that's not what happened. He wondered at himself at that which was come to pass. It was an idle tale to them. Notice how the Lord even has to go back in the Old Testament scriptures and expound the things concerning himself. The Old Testament saints did not understand that the Savior had to come down the cross, be buried and resurrected before he took the, takes the throne. It says in Luke 24, 25 through 27, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus had to go back and look at Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He had to get in the Psalms. He had to go through all the scriptures and explain to them the things concerning himself. All this stuff was hid from them. And the Christ-rejecting Jews are, are blind today. The nation of Israel as a whole is blind today to the gospel. And there's still some Jews that will believe and be saved, but as a whole, the nation of Israel is blind in part. They don't see Jesus in the Old Testament. And here, Jesus had to go back and expound unto them the things concerning himself. And this also proves to us that Jesus is in the Old Testament. He's on every page. Uh, I wish I could be a fly on the wall and be there with my red highlighter and, t and my red pen and every time that he says, well, this, this is me in this scripture, I'm going to highlight that in red and put how that's Jesus in that scripture. That's what I'm trying to do now, going through all the Old Testament, highlighting red every time I see Jesus and write down, this is Jesus because of this. You know, that's how you get accompanied with the sa Savior, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Luke 24, 44 through 45, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. You know, he told them that these things were going to happen. They still didn't understand that all these things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So it wasn't just in the law of Moses that it's taught that he's talked about. It's also in the Psalms and it's also in the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. He, I mean, he's all through the Old Testament. Jesus didn't just show up in a manger one day. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the ending. He's the first and the last. He's always been here and he's always will be. In Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. All things were made by him and for him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ has always been here, and he always will be. Then it says in verse 45, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. And that's what I pray for. God opened to me understanding, so that I can understand the Scriptures. We don't know anything about the Bible because we're smart. We know it because he opened our understanding about it. The disciples, most likely, were much smarter than us, but it was hid from them. God had to open their understanding. He has to open our understanding. 